Greetings, I'm Mel Fabricus, bringing you a very important message, especially for those of you whose Veritas subscription was cancelled by one of our payment processors some time ago. It took us a few weeks of hard labor to procure a new payment processing partner and a lot of coding. But, by popular demand, we now offer a payment option that only requires a credit card and no PayPal account. The new system is integrated into our secure website and does not send you to another site. Just click on the subscribe button at VeritasRadio.com, enter your credit card information, and you will receive your login immediately. I want to welcome many of you back to your Veritas family. Thank you. The questions you always had. The answers you were never given. The place to seek the truth. Welcome to Veritas. Tonight we explore consciousness, reality, and the nature of the self. Our special guest will speak intimately on what it is to be an authentic human being, what it is to be, and how we become sovereign in our center of awareness by drawing on many ancient traditions. The perpetual shift from fragmentation to wholeness and unity. This will be very appropriate for a current time. Greetings from your host, Mel Fabregas. And if you're new to the Veritas family, welcome home. To listen to tonight's full interview and all of our material, just click on the subscribe button. And don't forget to visit the Veritas store for MMS, hemp oil, pure organic sulfur, and much more. And if you want to get in touch with me, want to be a guest on this radio program, have a guest suggestion, or have feedback, just click on the contact button of our website at veritasradio.com. And to tell us more, tonight's special guest is Ryan McMahon, an author, researcher, and lover of wisdom. His path has been one of self-creation and unfoldment, and his approach to truth and reality is a syncretic one. His website is midnightsuns.net, and he joins us from San Diego. Hello, Ryan, and welcome to Veritas. How are you? I'm doing great, Mel. Thank you very much for having me on. Good to uh, talk to you. My pleasure. And just before we spoke a few weeks ago, I started watching some of your presentations, and today I watched one. And you mentioned a lot, a lot of great names. So my first question to you, first of all, give us a little bit of a background so our listeners can know who you are. But later, I want to know who your influences are. Okay, great. Um, well, my background, well, I mean, my background, you, you mean like getting into this whole sort of truth-seeking? All the way from the beginning, your Eureka moment. <laughs> my Eureka, Eureka moment. Wow. That's a... That's a, you know, that's, I guess that's a standard question, but for me, that's been um, a lifelong pursuit trying to answer that question Um, because ultimately, um, and you'll see this in some of my, some of my work, although I don't like my work to focus about it totally, but my Eureka moment really happened to me when I was like 19 years old. I engaged in a deeply spiritual journey, a quest to solve um, a healing issue. And I think that, um, I think that a lot of people come to the spiritual path uh, due to some sort of catastrophe or some sort of need for healing. And I'm, I'm just like those people. However, once I started to unravel and unpack the nature of my, my issues, I started to realize that this archetype of pain or this, this issue that's chronic with me uh, actually is as, long, as far back as I can remember. And I mean, I've even gone into ceremonial regressions to where I go back into my the deep psyche of my inner child. And um, as far as I can tell, uh, it, 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 it was here even before I had a personality formed. And I know that might sound strange to people, but um, it, it could have been just the process of, of coming into this world that, you know, is painful for, for the whole process of creation. But anyway, That put me on a spiritual path that really came to crux when I was 19 years old. And um, I talk a lot about that whole process in my first book, which is, um, it's called Tide and the Cranog. Um, And I, through this process, I I got guidance from from a a female spiritual yogi um, and changed my whole life, changed my whole perception of reality. And that's when my healing began. 
And believe it or not, I'm I'm 43 years old right now, and uh, I'm still in that process. I still have not completely undone um, the the chronic nature of of my pain. But I've come a hell of a long way, and that's why I'm actually like sharing my my you know my experiences with other people in videos and written a couple books, and um, people you know. Some people seem to really get a lot out of it, and so that's what keeps me sharing it. So hopefully that an- that answers your question. And what moves you now? Obviously, getting away from the pain, transmuting that into something better, transmuting that into something that it can help not only heal you, but heal humanity. There's This m- must resonate with a lot of people. Yeah, you know, that's, that's exactly right. I think that... <laughs> I'm pretty sure that um, whatever my my issues with pain, whatever their root source is, the purpose of having such a chronic thing, uh, I think, is a way that has forced me into um, pursuing a spiritual, pursuing my own spiritual nature, what what the spirit is, what it is to be a human being, and then also to sort of try to access what our our limitations are or lack thereof. And so, um, well, yeah, so that hopefully that helps there. It is moments like, I don't know exactly what you went through. You don't have to tell us, but a lot of people go through probably similar situations and they recur to this modality, spirituality and other, you know, meditation and so on. And do you start realizing that perhaps we are characters in a simulation and when you look at yourself from the outside looking in does that change who you are just questioning the nature of reality question of self who we are yeah it certainly does and i think most spiritual paths will emphasize that self-reflective process and i guess you could say in general philosophy you know the love of wisdom it can't be had without the self-reflection this this um taking an inventory of oneself. And I think the human being is the only creature on the planet that actually has this type of awareness. And um, so we have a great deal of power with that type of awareness. Um, and we have, obviously, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that that everybody at some point is going to gonna have something in their life that nudges them, you know, into a place that causes a deep self-reflection. Most of the time it's due to crisis or some sort of catastrophe um, or some sort of need for healing. But the philosophical traditions, you know, the the spiritual traditions, you could even say theology and religious traditions, I think they're all wellsprings that grow up around this, um, this, uh, this process of becoming more aware of who we are. And, um, that's, that's a labyrinth, right? That's, that's a tough thing to navigate. And there's all kinds of people with all kinds of uh, suggestions on how you should get through it. And, um, but the bottom line is, is that none of those people can bring you through it. You, you have to, you know, the, the path of selfhood or initiation in my belief is a self-induced process. So you're going to have to be alone, so to speak navigating that that labyrinth however there are guides and signposts and um we have access to to knowledge itself um and i don't mean i don't mean like book knowledge or traditional knowledge um i don't mean descriptions of things i mean gnosis like real knowledge and i believe that that we have access to that and that it exists and permeates uh the entire cosmos. I find it very interesting, Brian, that most people that I've interviewed in the last 10 years, probably the majority, whether it's in health, whether it's in spirituality, motivation, you name it, all the people who are doing something now for humanity, most of them have experienced some trauma that they have transmuted into something. And it makes me wonder, you probably know the name Dolores Cannon. She passed away years ago but she would conduct a regression hypnosis on people. And 
she would find out that most people who came to this plane we call Earth had a a plan, a contract, if you will, that they knew exactly what they were getting into when they came here. I always doubted that. I always think, you know, how can a child or somebody come here as a child and then be, you know, beaten to death by a criminal? And why would you do that? Mm -hmm. But then I have seen so many people with trauma, with chaos, who have transmuted that into the gurus that they are. Many of the best-selling authors that are out there have gone through something like this. And it makes you wonder, is that part of your destiny? Is that part of the plan coming here? Yeah, that's, that's a tough, it's a tough question, right? There is this, there is this, uh, this correlation, right? But causation is not always, does not always mean correlation, but we do have these pattern recognitions where we see, Hey, you know, this, like you said, many people that have gone through a hard, hardcore struggle will become, you know, guides for other people. However, why it happens, you know, why, why we have to go through this is to me is a mystery. Um, I think it, it, a lot of people would like to say they know, they know, like it's because this is your destiny. It's because you came in, you know, with, with karma from, from past incarnations or, or, um, you know, past lives. And even though I've peered into the spiritual world, I mean, literally like experienced and seen things, there's still, still very hard to, um, to say that one really knows. It's like, there's this, this concept in the Toltec teachings of, of, you know, the first attention and the second attention, there's even a third attention. But, but what that means is the first attention is like basically what is known and what is knowable to humans. And we tend to live there uh, because we feel we, it, it buffers us from our fears. Um, but there are spiritual giants and or practitioners that move into the second attention, which is basically the unknowable, that which cannot be known. And I know that sounds strange. It sounds like a, a contra how, it's like, how do you know if you're in the unknowable, right? It sounds like a contradiction a contradictory statement, but, um, but, but it, but when you, when you go there and then come back, you do have a knowing that you were there, right? You don't really know that you're there when you're there, but you know, when you're there, when you're not. And so what I'm getting at is that I don't really know if it's, if it's man's destiny, or I don't know if it's just, um, the harmonics of nature, you know, sort of like, you just happen to be um, at, at that time when the wave happened to be crashing up against, you know, the shore. And that's that's the moment you were born. And, you know, nature has just said, well, some of some of you will make it and some of you won't. And I'll leave it up to a bit of of chaos to to find out, you know, who makes it and who doesn't. And the ones that do that will just make you stronger and make you better, um, better growth, better guides better, uh, expressions of consciousness. So I'll try to sort of wrap that up. There is this very strange spiritual world that in my, my experience is absolutely real. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that it's real. The, the, the doubt that comes up for me is trying to understand it and trying to put it into, um, into words, right? Trying to put it into a framework and then and then uh, hope that the framework we put put upon it is correct, right? That we we actually know what we're talking about, and it's a very difficult thing. That's why you have so many different philosophical approaches, so many different types of guides and gurus. Um, but I do think that there is, I do think there is an unknowable realm, and we we actually have access to it. We can be there. We can ex we can. Um, we can experience it, but there's no way that we can actually put it into a frame. We can try. We can put it into terms of the first attention, which is the knowable. Um, but every time we do that, we lose its nuance and we lose its essence. And I'll kind of try to wrap this up by, by sort of pointing to this idea. Again, this is a Toltec idea, but there are other philosophers that talk to this as well, is that 
man has the faculty of reason uh, for a reason or for a purpose, but there is there's information the, or, or knowledge that cannot be had by reason. Um, and then when people hear that, they try to reason that statement. They try to reason it out. Well, how can, how can that be? And it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's sort of a somersault of the mystic mind is that you can't reason this, this uh, conundrum out, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So, um, there's a lot of work I've done with regression. Um, like I said, going back to my inner child and spiritual experiences through, through dreaming and recapitulation, um, that take me into realms that are paranormal or metaphysical or transcendental. And I've tried so many times to explain what's going on in my books and, and just with people in my social sphere, I do the best I can, but I, um, I really kind of shy away from trying to act like I understand that, that realm, even though I know that it's real. Do you think that we come here to this world? I mentioned the destiny, the contract, the plan, but yes. some people say we are products of our environment. Some people say that we're not, that we come here with certain traits and DNA in Basically, it's everybody's different, and you handle your life differently. What's your take on this? Hmm. I think that we have such a creative power. Human beings have such a, a co-creative ability that we can influence our, our own reality. And a lot of powerful people, people that work with the spirit, and with their own psyche and create like a psychic hygiene and work basically people on the path of selfhood that work work in these realms they start to realize their own creative power and they start to see how their their speech and their thoughts can affect the world around them and then some people make the jump that like oh that means that we created all this and i, I don't i don't believe that i think i think that the idea of a contract is a real thing um, but it's, it's this sort of, uh, I, I, I guess it depends on what kind of language you use to describe it. But if I was to describe a contract with the spirit world, I would have to go with the things that I, I think are, are real. And for me, and I'm only speaking from me is I do believe that the archetypes, uh, the young, you know, the Jungian psychological archetypes of our, our deep subconscious being and our deep and our mind or what the Toltecs would call allies or inorganic beings. I believe those things are real. And I think if we have contracts and or destinies, they're going to be in a, some sort of um, paired relationship with these archetypes. That's how we're going to become aware of them, or that's how we're going to work with the destiny. Now, that being said, these archetypes, I think, are... Are, they're not something that we can actually, we don't actually make them. Like we don't create them. They're the matrix of nature. They're the matrix of the mind. And Nietzsche talked about this, uh, and so did Jung, that some philosophers think that we created them and that we can just, we can control them. And um, I, I don't think that's the case. I think that they're, they're, more, they're more creative of us than we are of them because they're more ancient. They're, they're deeply intrinsic in the, the, the matrix of mind. Um, and you could even call this the imaginatrix, borrowing from Terence McKenna. And um, just because it's in your imagination doesn't mean that it's, that it's not real at all. Um, so to try to answer the question about contracts and destiny, I think there is something there. Um, but it changes as we grow and as we work and navigate our, our own being. And it, and it changes as these archetypes, these deep parts of our nature express themselves. Um, but I do think that that's kind of like to borrow a phrase, you know, the fabric, I think it's a fabric of reality that we have no choice, but to, um, as a human being, it's sort of our signature, it's our mold. This is how we, um, 
are connected and also how we co-create, change, and affect um, our lives as well as our minds and our bodies and our, our souls. You know, I'm thinking of a quote that you used on your presentation from R.A. Schwaller, the Lubix, from the word, oh, yeah. from the book Nature Word. If I may read this quote, it says, the fundamental error we have made is to have accepted a mentality which is in contradiction to the thinking of nature. We granulate into time and space what could be a grasping of a whole. We use spatial language to speak of non-spatial concepts. Our psychological consciousness projects its picture of things as a fragmented play of opposites back onto the external world and then takes this picture to be real, unquote. And the reason why I bring this up is because you mentioned speech and I think of language. I think language and speech are probably one of those limitations that has limitations that have been imposed upon us as humans. Because as Schwaller says, thinking of nature, the concepts are totally different. And what we think in language, isn't this just a granular level of what reality is? Yeah. What a great quote. Uh, you know, it is. Our age, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just agreeing with you. It is a great uh, quote. Oh, okay. You know, R. A. Schwaller de Lubix, for, for listeners, for your listeners out there, um, and of course, not everybody has the same kind of a, a, a mindset that I do, but man, if you've never read any R. A. Schwaller de Lubix or Isha Schwaller de Lubix, his wife, I highly recommend that, you know, you take a look at some of his work and whatever jumps out at you, grab it and read it. Um, because he was a true hermetic thinker. And a true, what I mean by that is someone who can see, uh, well, I would call a seer. A true seer is actually aware of the whole. And that's a very difficult thing to even talk about. But R.H. Schwaller de Lubix is sort of a master of language as well. His, he's so articulate that um, it's almost, I don't know, energetically, it's, it's incredibly intense and dense to digest his work. Um, however, I think for, for the most part, I think he's correct. Like I, I haven't had the insight ever in reading his work to, to point out his flaws, right? I think he's a genius. So I, I, I think that that quote is, is exactly what's going on in the world right now. And I, I kind of assume that it's always gone on, but I think our technologies ampl amplify this process. So let's see here. The way to explain this is, you know, we become, we, we, we create technologies in order to afford creature comforts, to extend life, to, um, protect us from the exposure to the elements, you know, to procure food. And also when we do that really well, we procure leisure time and we procure entertainment, we procure, and all that affects our social relationships and then thus affects our life. But what happens is, is we get caught up in our own symbols or our own language. And this kind of goes back to what I was referring to with the Toltec thing is the, uh, the unknowable or the second attention is the whole. It's the universe as it truly is. And it would be so vain for a human being to deny that that, that is or that that exists we we know so here's the thing like being in the first attention we know that the unknowable is there i don't know i don't know any other way to say it right because i'm limited by by language by the symbols but i think we all know that there's something beyond like beyond the beyond right and we get we've created technologies in order to shield ourselves from that frightening reality because a lot of us don't want to um, feel that kind of freedom they don't want to sit in the center of the universe so to speak and be responsible for just them their own being like we find ourselves here on this planet and um, most of the language that people use if you really listen to people it is always deferring their freedom they're always giving their power away because they're afraid of, of this whole they're afraid of being at the center of their own world they're afraid of being you know alone and or all one 
and walking through this mystery as a, as a warrior, right? Borrowing from David Whitehead, he's like a truth warrior, you know, or, or a Toltec warrior. And um, it's a, you know, Delubix is talking about how we get lost in our own words, our own language and our own symbols. And we, we get so familiar with that technology that we start to believe uh, that that's that's the um, the ultimate reality when what it re- really is is just is sort of a simulacra. It's a reality that we've created that we've put up uh, because the whole is overwhelming to most people, m- myself included. But I think the spiritual path, the, the spiritual journey, you know, and or like let's say universal consciousness, Christ consciousness. Buddha, you know, um, enlightenment, the whole idea, the whole concept is um, removing our barriers, removing our limitations, and actually experiencing experiencing the world, the universe and reality uh, as it is in each moment. And um, in my, like, you know, that reminds me, um, Michael Tessarian is also extremely re- articulate and has a great language to talk about this sort of thing. And he said something to me in the last Unslaved podcast. We were talking about mysticism. We were talking about, you know, this approach to reality and how difficult it is to articulate. And he said, well, most people, when they hear like so-and-so is a mystic or so-and-so is mystical or so-and-so is a guru or enlightened, they always, um, they always project this, this, this person that, you know, this person is being beyond uh, what is, being transcendental, being beyond what is. And Michael Tessarian just goes, no, it's it's not that at all. It's there, the mystic is actually the only one who's seeing what is, for what it is. Like seeing his own immortality, or let's say his own mortality, seeing his own vulnerability, his or her, seeing his weaknesses, seeing his strengths, all of that, um, its power, its divinity, all that reflected in the nature that he's in or she's in. And so what I'm trying to say is the mystic is just the person who has let, let go of all of those descriptions and is actually just totally seeing the universe for what it is. And that doesn't sound too mystical, but when you think about it, uh, it's incredibly difficult to, to to get there. And then when we do get there, it's also incredibly difficult to, to live there. And so in some sense, it's a mystery because we all find ourselves popping in and out of these states. Um, and we go, wow, I'm at the center of my whole world. And you, you, you have that revelation. And then the next day, you know, it's gone. Life is different. And so it is, it is very mysterious that this happens to us and that we have access to it. But I think it's the mystic that has learned how to, you know, go back to that center and just be. You said something very interesting and very important when you said that the gurus see life and the world as it is. But we go to school, our educational system teaches us how to think, not basically to think for ourselves what i'm sorry what to think not how to think therefore i say it again you know it's like that famous saying the mind can't see what the mind doesn't know if all the concepts are taught to us from kindergarten all the way to doctorate degree these concepts are all language based do you think language has been responsible for fragmenting our perception of reality oh man (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what a question. Um, the answer, my answer would be, it's both. There's a bit of order and there's a bit of chaos in language itself or in each symbol, in symbology. And that's why you need to become uh, symbol aware or symbol literate and, or, you know, become aware of our language. So to try to answer that question, yes, language fragments our reality. It breaks it up into um, digestible pieces that we feel less afraid of and comfortable with. However, um, language is, is not something that's fixed, right? It's, it's a, it's a power where you and I are engaging in that right now. And the human being is 
incredible that we have this ability that you and I, we can dream up literally like dream, go into the dream world and we could create a new symbol right now that's never been created before or a new word or a new meaning. And so language is something that's, that's nuanced and it's, it's an energy, it's an energetic, you know, and so it's never fixed. And so, yes, we're limited by our language. Um, however, the process of languaging, and I'll even jump to say minding is also what transcends the limits of language itself. So um, I'll go, I'll say it like this. The great psychiatrist Thomas Saws, in his book, The Meaning of Mind, he talks about, he calls language, he says, he says the process of minding um, and or psychoanalysis is actually a language art. And it's like what you just brought up. The reason why you brought up this question is because there's a part of us, if, we, if, we're, if we're still enough and we pay attention enough, we're aware of our power and creation, we do start to realize that, that psychoanalysis and minding is, is dictated by the tools that the mind needs or uses. And in this case, it's language. So it's kind of like the, the, the movement and energetics and nuances of language is sort of like it's a tool. But you could take a tool, like let's say, you know, let's say I, I have a hammer. Well, a hammer is designed to, to drive nails into things. But I could also use it to um, reach up a little bit higher than myself and, and uh, you know, grab something off a shelf. And so, but that's not what a hammer is, but I could use it that way. And so language is just like that. It's like, it has its framework, its symbology that's unique to the human condition. And that all comes out of nature, the grunts and tones that we, you know, that we perceive and we translate all of those things into language. However, we can, and, and that is limiting. However, we can use that same process to um, unravel the limits that we created with the same tool. And uh, language is just so powerful. It's what my last my last talk on with Unslaved was about the Kabbalion, um, but really from a from a writing and language and symbol perspective. And it's so incredible. Like there's some people that are just I don't even understand how they have figured this out. Like Alvid Boyd Kuhn and William Lawrence Lyons, um, those come to mind right now. And they, you know, and actually R. A. Schwaller de Lubix talks a lot about symbol and language as well. The fact that they were able to uncover, or become aware of their own creativity within language and their own nuance within language is in itself a way to transcend the language that they're using. It's a way to use the tool in a different way. So I know that's kind of a really broad answer, but hopefully that sort of speaks to that. Let me go back to R.A. Schreller, the Lubix, for a moment, because I'm new to his work. I am looking forward to reading his books and his wives. But wasn't he an Egyptologist? And when he wrote this book, it was after 15 years of spending time in Egypt and learning everything that was to be learned about Egypt do you think he found something there, perhaps a lack of a language? And maybe he came to the conclusion that the ancient ones had a different way of communicating and conceptualizing our reality. Yeah, he certainly did find something there. However, <clears throat> I don't think he, he found, well, it depends on how you look at it or how it depends on how we say it, right? Um, I don't think he found the lack of language. I think he found a fundamental language, which we in the, the modern West have sort of forgotten about and lost. And it's a tough, it's a tough thing to pin it down into one, like, what is this? What did he find? The, the best way for me to describe it would be really just Pythagorean. You know, he, 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 he being a hermeticist follows the hermeticists come out of a line of sages, you know, of, of masters of alchemists and of philosophers. And, um, Pythagoras is one of the, the, the philosopher kings of, of that line. And um, what R.A. Schwaller de Lubix found was exactly what the, the people who built 
the structures there. I mean, obviously not all of them because they're built at different times, but he spent his 15 years at, at Luxor and other, other temples too, but his, most of his work was on the temple of Luxor. And the reason why he was able to, um, uncover this, this rudimentary language, which really, if you really get into it, it's really all about number. It's about geometry, mathematics, vortex mathematics, form as dictated by the language known as number. And what he found was what we used to know. And he's trying to revive it and bring it back to the modern man because he is fully aware, just like Steiner and Goethe and, and uh, Schauberger and, uh, uh, you know, other, other physicists, Tesla, they all realize that our modern description or modern model of atomic physics and quantum mechanics and or you could just say math in general is um is uh incoherent and he's kind of trying to wake up the western man and say hey look you've gone too far off you've gotten a, you've gotten consumed with the, the description of the symbols that you created and you are lost in that world and you think that it's real but i can show you that it's actually not because it, there's so much, there's so much disconnection there, um, so much c- dissonance, and he knows that nature. Again, back to the quote, you know, nature verb or nature word. Um, he knows that nature is not dissonant; it's it's a harmonic, and there are there is dissonance involved in nature, but it's the fray, you know, it's um, it's the, it's how nature, uh, how do you say it, separates the wheat from the chaff or burns off its own, you know, fluffs off its own skin. That's, that's the dissonance. And it's a very small part of what keeps things going, keeps things in, in, in ever new perpetual fecundity or growth. And so Schwaller de Lubix, being a hermeticist was trained by, and I don't know exactly, he's got his mentors, but he was trained by, you know, a secret, a secret order on how to how to think holistically. So I'm saying that because you 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 asked you mentioned in the question like our modern educational systems are not concerned at all with teaching our children how to think. They're obviously concerned with teaching them what to think. It's very 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 much miseducation and propaganda, and uh, I'd say it actually very dangerous. Um, you know, Pink Floyd. I mean, I know I'm kind of going all over the place here, but Pink Floyd, you know. No, no, go ahead. Talk about Pink Floyd. I love everything yeah. Pink Floyd. <laughs> okay. So it's like, you know, you know, teachers, we don't need your education. Um, you know, you're just another brick in the wall. Yeah. And that's what he's talking about, right? And he's not, obviously Pink Floyd is, is, is picking up on stuff that a lot of people, a lot of people have been talking about and picked up on. And we used to know how to think and we used to be actively engaged in nature, we used to be immersed in nature, and nature would reflect back to us our true nature, our true essence, quite literally, because our mind is the is made up of the archetypes of nature. And so, again, Michael, I, I know I'm going all over the place, but Michael Tessarian talks about this too, where um, nature has dropped man's image from itself and or its visage because man has gotten so far away from its center he's become egocentric right and so man in his anxiety of living in the ego for for so long he's going back to nature trying to find or see his original visage his original image and he can't find it there it is there, but he he doesn't he can't he doesn't recognize his own being, and so he gets even more anxious from this process, and um, tries to put his footprint you know tries to dominate nature for because he's so anxious and so fearful by you know putting lasers in the jungle or um, you know whatever it is skyscrapers you know in in a pristine forest or something, and he's just perpetuating this. Um, this, uh, you know, this, this fall, fall away from center. And so R. H. Waller de Lubix uncovered the harmonics. That's the easiest way to say it. The harmonics of the temple of Luxor, which 
is also known as the Temple of Man. And um, I think he he already knew before he even went there that there was a really strong chance that he was going to find what he was looking for. But he had to be a master at language, number, geometry, mathematics, harmonics, cymatics, light, sound, as well as the anatomy of the human body. He had to be a master of all of that in order to to discover what he knew he was looking for and then put it all together into multiple works and then, you know, articulate it for the, for the modern public. And so he's one of the few Egyptologists that, that did that. He's, he's the, he's like the, the, the best one that I have ever discovered in his book, the temple of man is a big, huge book. And he goes through like, it's crazy. He goes through, uh, the the whole gamut of how the pyramids were built, w- what the mathematics were, how they knew them, how they found them out, what t- what parts of nature tipped us off to even being able to discover these principles, and I'll kind of try to I'll try to wrap this up. Since he thinks holistically, he's able to see the temples and the structures in a whole different way see them much more for the purpose that they might have been made built for to begin with. And that purpose is obviously still present because they're still standing. And um, most modern buildings won't last 200 years, you know, but yet these buildings can be, you know, 5,000 years old or more. And it, it's just an incredible feat that human beings actually pulled this off. And Ari Schwaller de Lubix is trying to sh- to get the modern man to go back and remember and understand those harmonics that exist in nature because those same harmonics are actually what sustain us as as human beings, as, as each individual form. And they, and they not only sustain the body – um, and all of the physiology involved with it, but they sustained the mental capacity, you know, and the emotional capacity. And then of course it's this whole thing we're talking about is, is a spirit. I'm glad you said human beings who created those monuments, because many people who come here immediately pull the ancient alien thing. And I think, <laughs> why do we have to give credit to an unknown when it could have been us, if something happens right now, an EMP, a ca- cataclysm, and in the future, you know, they unearth 100 years, 200 years from now, they unearth stuff. They're going to call it, oh, those were the plastic people. Oh, yeah, they found little bricks, I found, but they don't know what they are. But does that mean that aliens created it? No, but something happened in the past. You know, Graham Hancock, he calls it the all of a sudden. You see pyramids more or less in, this, in different places around the world coming up at the same time. The commonality yeah. is one language, in my opinion, and it's mathematics, because you have so many similarities between the architecture and the engineering. Some language that everybody shared, did they teach one another? Did they learn that from somewhere else? Was the world united in a common language? Were we one civilization at one point in our history? These are questions to ponder. Yeah, they are. And, you know, I've listened to a, a few people on your show. I, I don't remember which shows, but that do address the ancient alien topic. And I've seen all those shows on television. When they first came out, I was like, this is really neat. I was very fascinated by it. And, you know, I enjoyed them a lot. Um, however, I actually have a background in, in film and um, out of college. And I can sort of see the, the narrative being generated. And I can see the sensationalism being marketed. And I can see the the uh, some of the people that are there as quote unquote experts, and I can see them as you know um, c- celebrity personas, and so there's quite a bit of lack. Uh, there's quite a bit lacking in that ancient alien theory um, from the television, modern television perspective, and so I don't buy into it at all. And I'll go ahead, <laughs> I'll go ahead and just say it to anybody out there listening. To me, it's it's almost preposterous and almost it's incredibly foolish to to externalize your own power and project in that something again something beyond us something more powerful than us something greater than us made 
these structures that are clearly man-made structures, right? The, the tools that were, the tools that exist to make a pyramid or make a temple are tools that are uniquely created by humans. Like horses don't make screwdrivers, you know, and crocodiles don't make lasers and, you know, birds don't make table saws. And I'm not saying those were the tools used to make these buildings. What I'm saying is, is that it's crazy that people can buy into this idea that some other race that's off planet um, came down here and built these things or taught us how to build these things. I think it would be much more likely to go the human being itself has a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of awareness. And we have, I, I, I don't know how limited we are, but we definitely have the ability to conceive of the mathematics. Um, R.H. Waller de Lubix does that in his book. He, he will tell you exactly, exactly how this block was made and break it down to Pythagorean math and it all works, right? And so we obviously know how to think that way. And just because we're not doing that now in our modern world doesn't mean that our ancestors didn't or couldn't. I think the I think that it's foolish to to think of my favorite Martian as being our our um handlers, you know. I think that's just a I think that's just a way in which the architects of control if i can borrow that phrase again the the architects of control mass media and over social engineering like how they want us to think um i think it's very easy to follow the thread that you know a thousand years ago every culture had a boogeyman and we still have one today but now you can turn on your TV and you can just watch it. You can flip through it and go, well, do I want it to be predator? Do I want it to be alien? Do I want it to be, you know, a Sasquatch? What do I want it to be, right? And if you look at the sensationalism of ufology, and don't get me wrong, I'm not denying that other life forms out there exist, and I'm not even denying that unidentified flying objects exist, but the whole culture that's been propagated is clearly one that's manufactured as a story. Like it's, it's a great, uh, you know, 70, 80 year story that started with, um, comic books talking about UFOs and, and then, you know, then it, then it became on TV or where it was my favorite Martian. And then it was, you know, Buck Rogers and then it was Battlestar Galactica and star Wars. And these are, these are all stories that we've created, you know, mythologies, if maybe if you want to say it that way. This is very interesting what we're talking about, because obviously what started me on this radio program was my fascination about extraterrestrial life. But after 10 years of doing this, and I know some people get offended when I talk about it, if the architects of control, as you call them, as Michael Desiron calls them, yeah. if, they, if they really wanted us to know that extraterrestrials existed, it would be a threat to the establishment. Because if they, if a civilization from outside of this earth comes here, that alone tells us that they're more powerful than we are, technology-wise at least. Yeah. And they're more advanced in every way. They could have conquered disease, uh, longevity, you name it, all of it. Do you think they really would want us to interact with them? Absolutely not. The controllers would not want that at all because we would be, and even religions, We'll be looking up to them for guidance, not to these people who are, let's not give them too much control, but quote unquote control. So to me, when you have the media, you have Hollywood putting all these movies about extraterrestrial life. In my opinion, this is a script that's coming to an end very soon. They really, as you mentioned, the boogeyman, you know, Werner von Braun that said, first, we're going to have communism. Then we're going to have terrorism. And then we're going to have a celestial object coming, the asteroid. And then we're going to unite the entire world with an extraterrestrial threat. I think all these ET movies that are that have been around since the 1950s, I would say, are in preparation to brainwash the population for the time that they say this is a fake alien invasion. 
and there we go. One world government. Your opinion on this? Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree that that's, that's more, that's more reasonable, more logical, uh, a scenario and should be taken more serious than, than all these other ones. Now, is it going to happen that way? I don't know, but I think the architects of control are constantly trying to figure out ways to control. And this is just one of the narratives, you know, that, that might work. Um, and so they're constantly, it's basically like with what I call alternate setback. It's like, if they can't set you back this way, they'll, they'll have an alternate way to set you back. Now, that being said, a couple things, I don't like to use my own language as if I'm a victim because, um, the language of, of victimhood doesn't serve you in any way except to show you, um, you know, where you need to start going up from. And so when I say they, I really have no fear about the architects or control. I think that it's just no different than any other um, animal trying to dominate another animal for all kinds of different reasons. And um, they feed on your ignorance and they feed on you like, uh, you know, the lie that they're selling you. It's like, did you buy it? They're, they're, they're banking on most people are going to buy it few people that see through it, we're going to lose those people, but most people are going to buy the lie. And so I think that your scenario, and it's interesting because uh, you have explored, you've explored the, way more of the, this topic than I have. Um, but let me tell you, hopefully I can articulate this, where, how I, where, how I came, came to this position. Now, this is a tough thing to talk about, but when I hear the word ET, extraterrestrial, I don't think of Steven Spielberg and that little that little Elliot guy with the glowing finger. Um, I think of the word extraterrestrial, which means off planet, or or even another way to to use that language is just not earthbound. Okay, so I think extraterrestrials exist. I think that. If we go to another planet, we'll find bacteria or life, animals, organisms. Those are all what we could call extraterrestrial because they're not on this. They're not on this terra firma. Um, you could call them organisms, animals, or aliens. All three of those terms would work. Now, I believe that the universe is full of life, and so there's probably life all over the place. However, when I this is just me. When I think about extraterrestrials in my world and living here on Earth, I think about spiritual beings because I've seen, you know, I've experienced them. I think lots of people have experienced paranormal activity, whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, ghosts or light or I don't know what you want to call it. Um, there's all kinds of terms for them, but I, I have experienced these things throughout most of my life and so so many times that i just absolutely know it's a real part of nature it's 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 a real thing now for people who haven't experienced it they'll just think i'm crazy for saying that there's nothing i can do for those people you, you don't have to believe me but what i'm trying to get at is when you peer into a, another world or maybe it's this world but it's a more subtle world, maybe, you know, a more spiritual world where you have different beings there, maybe beings of light, angelic beings or and or dark forces as well. That's what I think of when I hear the word extraterrestrial, because they're not really bound to the to the solidity or the gravity of Earth. And so, you know, I don't call those things aliens. And I don't think that they are aliens. I think that they're part of nature. Um, I think they are intimately connected to, to the earth somehow, but but they're just in a different form. You know, they're in a they're in a more subtle form. That's I all. think this is also a bit of arrogance in the part of human beings because when we look at animals and they have the ability to smell and to see way beyond what we can. I mean, what is it? Our visual and, and our audio spectrum, they're so limited. And just because yeah. we can't hear or we can't see, does that mean that 
We are not right now. You and I don't have a few interdimensional beings standing next to us listening to what we're saying, but we just can't yeah. see or hear them. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I think I can't, I wish I could quote it, but I can't, but um, I don't know if you know who Sad Guru is. No. Um, oh, he's great. He's a, he's a Hindu, you know, spiritual leader. Um, and he's really like, uh, really digestible, very intelligent, smart guy, but, but doesn't like, um, talk over people. He's not like a pontificator, you know, he speaks in, in normal language. Um, but he, he does talk about that very thing where he talks about an owl and he's like, you know, an owl can see and hear way beyond the spectrum that we can. And so when it responds to something that we cannot see, how arrogant it would be for the human to say, well, that thing that it's responding to must be an aberration for the owl. It must not really exist because we can't detect it. It's like, how backwards can you, can you be, you know? And so he's basically saying what you said. And that, that makes perfect sense to me that there's, there's things that we can't hear. There's things that we can't see. Um, but there's also things that are unique to the human that animals don't have. You know, we have this power that we can self-reflect upon our symbols, make language in the mind, and then abstract that language out into the physical world, literally put language in the physical world, and then self-reflect on it again. Now it's out of the mind. It's in the real world. We can work with it again. And eventually that language can fully make a concept uh, a, a full har harmonious idea. And then we can take that idea that really came out of our mind and we can build it in the physical world. There's no other creature on the planet that has that, that power. And you know, an owl, I know this is a strange conversation, right? But if an owl is perched up watching, you know, 90 days of some house being built and just watches it every day, the owl has no idea how it's coming into being. It doesn't know how this structure just appears, you know, and then one day it's done and the owl just sits on the roof and just goes, magic. This was magic. This wasn't here last year. Now it is. It's <laughs> magic. And you know, it is magic. It really is. But that's a power that we have, humans have, that animals don't. But they have powers that we have, that, that they have, that we don't. And you know, you just have to respect them. And this is why native people around the world have so much respect for the animal kingdom, because they realize they have certain attributes that we don't have, but if we can use them. I mean, look at in that earthquake years ago in Indonesia, that tribe, only one tribe survived because it was days or, or hours before the tsunami. They climbed a mountain. Only one person died because it was a paraplegic who couldn't someone help but the rest of them it makes you wonder did they have a trait a human trait that we lost because we have been domesticated or were they listening to the animal kingdom and listening and observing dogs and other animals that all of a sudden were going to higher ground and they said let's move right now and they all got saved well i think the answer is both um i don't know if you've looked at um this guy bernie taylor um oh yes he's, yes he's, bernie he's, he's been, been with us Oh, he has? He's been on your show? Yeah. Fantastic. You're, you're ahead of me. I just recently found him. Um, but I, I'm reading his book. Uh, God, I hope I don't miss inter um, the title. I think it's called Biological Time. Right. And, you know, he goes through and explains pretty, pretty realistically and rationally uh, how our calendars, all different types of calendars, how they came into being and how – this actually goes right along with our conversation and how like when you turn your wrist over today and you look at your watch, assuming it's not a digital watch, um, and you see that circle and you go, it's three o'clock in the afternoon or whatever it is, you've, you've, most human beings have no idea how that watch came to be a, a, a marker of cyclical time and or a calendar. And it's just one small part of a calendar. You know, it really measures a 24-hour day. But that's a part of a much larger cycle, you know, a week, a month, a year, many moons, many suns, uh, 
you know, centuries, millennium, millennials, millenniums, and then, you know, yugas or great years. And it's crazy that like nine out of 10 people on, on that I know in my environment have no idea what the procession of the equinoxes is or what the great year is or what the, the, um, uh, the platonic year is. Um, and Bernie Taylor, that's why I'm talking about this is he really shows you at how we learned from being connected to the animals and, or just nature. But we built our calendars probably originally, like there, maybe there are other cycles that Bernie, uh, is unaware of, but the ones that he's brought to me are these very ancient cycles of, of animal migrations and spawnings and, um, you know, the, um, the, the life and birth cycles that exist with certain animals. Like for example, the sa- he talks a lot about the salmon and different fishes and we built our ancient peoples. We built time cycles based on those salmon in these specific locations and these specific rivers at this specific time of year in order for us to survive, we needed to have a successful catch every, every year. Like if we didn't have a successful catch, the old people might die that year, you know, and the young might not make it. And so we built, we built full calendars, religious traditions, ceremonies, um, theologies, mythologies, and also movements of people, ourselves, all on these harmonics and cycles of nature that we conveniently forget today. However, what you're talking about is when those people in Indonesia are paying attention to the animals, they're attuned to to what the, the cycles of the animals are doing, and then who knows, they might also just be attuned themselves. They might be able to feel the vibration They might be, they just might know the wind of change is blowing and they can smell it, you know? And so I think the answer is both. Well, let's break this segment. We're going to take a one and only break and come back and get deeper into our philosophical conversation. But, you know, jokingly, somebody asked me the other day, because they know that I deal with all these topics, but they're joking and trying to poke fun at, at this stuff. And somebody asked me, so Mel, what is the meaning of life? And I jokingly answered, life has no meaning. And he said, oh, wow, that's really negative to say. No, 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 wait. You give meaning to life. Would you agree (laughs) with that? Well, I certainly do. Um, And I'm coming from a healing perspective. um, And I'm I'm right along, I'm right along, you know, bored with Jordan Peterson and his book, Maps of Meaning, Mm -hmm. and his 12 Rules for Life. And I I think that... um, you know, he, he's embodying these very like fatherly or grandfatherly traditional archetype that all of our peoples needed to live and know in order to make, to survive. And um, one of the one of the most important things that I got from him is that, you know, life is not about pursuing happiness. He's like, life is about finding meaning or cultivating or making meaning. And to me, that really really rings true because it's obvious that it's pretty obvious that like you can be rich and famous and you can basically have the the world in the palm of your hand and still be incredibly miserable i mean you know i wouldn't want to trade my life with any celebrity i think they're (laughs) they're much more miserable than i am even though they might have an abundance of money um or other things so i'm i'm more concerned with you know authentic meaning in my life and with the people that I come in contact with. And, you know, I think that that's, it's, you know, that's what it's about. Absolutely. And when we come back, I want to continue with this. This is a very deep conversation that requires more pondering, but how can people buy your book, Sun King, and learn more about your work, Ryan? Oh, awesome. Um, Most of my sales are done on Amazon. Uh, That'd be the easiest place to find me. Um, I have a lot of videos on YouTube, all different types of talk topics. Um, but my first book is called Tide and the Cranog. And uh, Cranog is an Irish word uh, for a man-made island used for defense in war times. So Tide and the Cranog on Amazon. And then my second book is called Sun King. Um, subtitle is Soul Harmonica. And they're both 
on Amazon. You can just Google my name and, and or those those books and should come right up. And then um, I have one more book I'm, I'm publishing this year, which is about um, the the life story of a of a Sundance Lakota Sundance spiritual leader um, out of Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And so that one's all about the Native American um, tradition and the the seven seven sacred values that they basically that they live live by. Excellent. Well, folks, don't go anywhere. One more hour with Rob McMahon coming up. This is Mel Fambergas, and you are listening to Veritas. See you in the member section. Thank you for listening to the first part of this very important Veritas interview. To listen to the rest and all of our material, proceed to the members section or subscribe at VeritasRadio.com. Don't forget to visit the Veritas store for MMS, hemp oil, pure organic sulfur, and other great products. Thank you.